Please hold the line. We will answer your call as soon as possible. I'm Michael Schneider, founder and CEO of Service. This is another edition of Please Hold. Today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Blake Irving, who is the CEO of GoDaddy, a little uh, registrar and provider of small business tools you may have heard of. And uh, Blake, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for Thanks, being here. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Like that background, that brick background on you. Um, I'm, I'm based in LA and we have a lot of earthquakes, so we, we <laughs> like authentic brick in my neck of the woods. Yeah. I hope it's been seismically retrofitted. It hasn't at all. It's a super old <laughs> building, but let's hope there's not an earthquake during this call. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I want to jump right in about with your history, and it's very telling that there's a drum set right behind you. Um, I read that your undergrad degree is in fine art, <clears throat> and you were a drummer in college, um, yep. sort of like a drummer for hire, maybe not a consistent band. Um, yeah. And, and so I'm just curious what a drummer and a fine art major is doing at the helm of one of the world's most important technology companies. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, I think a lot of it has to do with what I found interesting as I was growing up, both in studying art. And I was, uh, truth be told, I was a graphic artist and a typographer. So I was studying type. Uh, and what, what happened was I had a company, Xerox, who was very, very early um, in 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 computers and in digital printing and in digital typography, did a, a portfolio review in one of the classes I was in and asked if I'd come in an interview with them. This is 81. It's a long time ago. You know, this is... Is this before or after the Steve Jobs, Xerox, Park, that whole thing? Uh, this is just around the same time, a little before it. So that okay. happened in mid, like in the mid-80s. 81 was a little earlier than that. Um, and so I went, went down to interview with them and they put me behind, put me on this thing called an Alto computer, which was a full WYSIWYG, uh, WYSIWYG workstation, 512K uh, removable, had a 10 megabyte, remo 10 megabyte removable hard drive, 512K of RAM on this thing, attached to the ARPANET, laser printer 300 feet from your office. I mean, it was full automation and a lot of really brilliant guys doing some pretty interesting things. And I fell in love. I just fell in love with doing that. Now, all the while I was doing that, I found, uh, you know, I was a jazz musician growing up, and found that to be an incredibly creative outlet for me. And I kept doing that uh, on weekends. And as you said, I was doing a lot of studio stuff. I didn't dedicate to one band. I played in a whole bunch of different kinds, and I was a pretty reasonable sight reader. So when a band came into town and they needed somebody to play their gig. Uh, you know, I'd get a phone call and say, hey, sh show, show up. Here's rehearsals at this time, uh, the shows at this time. And uh, I, would, I would do that um, and so, then work full time. So do you think there's a connection? Because a lot of uh, CEOs, if you think about left brain and right brain, a lot of CEOs, I would say, are very um, analytical and not necessarily uh, musicians or artists or painters. Uh, but do you think there's a connection between effective leadership and the fine arts? Uh, you know, I think there, there's a couple different ways to look at it. I think that, you know, left brain or right brain, I think most of the folks that I've met that uh, have you know, more eclectic backgrounds like mine that find themselves in leadership roles access both sides. So there's an analytical side and a creative side. And I think most of the folks, especially software developers that I've met throughout my career, have been musicians and artists and incredibly analytical at the same time, but fancy themselves uh, linguists as well as analysts and have you know very sharp views on problem solving and how to go about that, but also have the, the thought that the way that you express yourself in code can be incredibly personal. Uh, and in fact, you know, folks, a lot of the programmers I was working with at Microsoft in the early 90s fancy themselves sort of artists because they believe what they did was a pure expression of their thought uh, and that they were going to express it differently than anybody else would. You know, the less, some folks were the less characters, the better. You know, my comments mattered. I mean, it was, it was quite interesting, actually. Yeah. So I think that, that an art that, that, that is accessing both sides uh, in music, and this is interesting, uh, when you're a drummer, and I used to play in 22-piece big bands and a lot of jazz bands, and you're reading charts and whatnot, and if you, your job in life is to support all the rest of the musicians in the band, making sure that you're laying down a beat, that you're you know, reading four bars ahead, and you're setting them up for breaks and, and you know, vamps and all kinds of things, and that you know exactly where you are, and you can lead them down the path 
while they're soloing on top of you and, and working ensemble work on top of you. So you're really sitting in the back of the band where most drummers sit, at least that's where we ought to be. Um, and the rest of the band is actually playing on top of you and your job's just to basically lead them just by laying down a solid foundation they can play on top of. And I think if, if I think of leadership, generally I think that's what leaders are supposed to do. You know, every once in a while you might get a, you know, maybe you get a drum solo or you trade fours with somebody. But honestly, your job as a leader is to lay a foundation for the rest of the business to go build on. And I have found that to be be, be true across my career, I think. Yeah, no, it's a great analogy. The, there's very few solo performers um, that are successful. It's always a team effort. So Always. I like the analogy. So tell me how you got to GoDaddy. I read that you were in semi-retirement, which I'm not clear the difference between retirement <laughs> and semi-retirement. <laughs> But you, you had done well. You were at Microsoft in the early days. Then you were at Yahoo, and you were kind of kicking back a little bit. And um, something about GoDaddy, I suspect, got you back into the game. What was it? Uh, you know, so I had a, a headhunter send me a document about the company. Um, I know I was about to pull the trigger on another, another uh, role in the Silicon Valley, more traditional uh, Silicon Valley job, and had been a customer of GoDaddy's for better part of five years, maybe seven years, and had, a, had 49 domains under management, I think, and had done some some things on top and just, you know, secured intellectual property uh, and others and had uh, had experience with Were the company. Were you a domain shark? Were you like buying and reselling domains or? No, oh, no, I'd never, I'd never resold one. I buy them because I have an idea. And this, I represent the customer. This is why it was so interesting to me. I represent the customer that we serve, which was, I have an idea. I'm going to go reserve the intellectual property on that idea. Uh, which is usually a name, uh, and I'm going to go get that name, and then I'm going to go do something with it. And some people do, some people don't. Some people do it once. A lot of guys that are in the technology business have quite a few registered because they've had a lot of ideas and want to reserve it. Um, so I had done that uh, and had spent time talking with their customer care organization, which was unlike any I'd ever spoken to in tech. They were just incredibly responsive, very thoughtful and knowledgeable, uh, and actually cared about what, what you were doing. Uh, and, but I, I'd seen the commercials too, didn't quite understand them, but I knew that they were incredibly effective. And I'd been using the products for a while. I knew that the products could be, uh, could be, could be better. Uh, and so I went through this document that the guys sent me uh, after asking if I'd be interested. And I said, you know, I don't know if I'd be interested. It doesn't seem like necessarily a, 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 a company that's perfect for what I've done with my career. He goes, well, just let me send this document and show you. And what I found in the document was this incredible market, this huge market of people that have uh, you know ideas just like me, a billion dollar company with great cash flow, with you know NPS in the mid '60s, net promoter score in the mid '60s, with brand recognition uh, up in the '80s, with very low you know customer turnover, 85 percent customer retention rate, all these things that just blew, kind of blew my mind because they were not, not something that I would think. I didn't think the size of the company was going to be that large. I didn't think the, the loyalty and the customer base was going to be that, that incredible. And I didn't know that the, the, the economics of the company were great. Now, Mike, they had done all of that in the United States and had never left the country. And, and so, you know, in looking at it, I just started thinking, my gosh, what, what could this be in a decade? You know, how fast could you get it there? And who would you bring along to go make it happen? And I thought, oh, my gosh. So if we built a super flat platform, did it on top of OpenStack, did it in a way where everything was API and every product in the company was using the other services that were built in the company, and nobody was building, I'll call it, you know, vertically stacked, um, vertically stacked, non uh interfaceable products with each other that were actually building a flat platform and then we localized it globalized it and and took it into you know every market that made sense in the u.s uh and then open technology centers in places where the best technologists are like what what, what could we what, what could this look like and i started kind of thinking about it and got kind of excited and then had some conversations with the board uh and um, you know, told them what I thought I would, you know, they asked me, what do you think you would want to do with the company? And I said, well, this is what I, the opportunity that I see and, and what I think we could probably do. And in fact, I've got a whole bunch of people that I think would be really interested in doing just this. Um, and you know, the comment, one of the comments, one of the board members was, well, that's good because that's kind of our investment thesis. 
uh, that's what the, we think this could look like. Um, and so for the last, you know, I, I ended up taking the job um, and contacted quite a few friends and folks that I've worked with in the industry before doing so and just kind of bounced the company and what I had found off of them and, and what I thought this place could be. And they started getting excited. Um, and so for the last three and a half years, almost four years now, we've been building out the platform, uh, an OpenStack platform that's well API, new e-com stack, building out our localization, globalization, uh, global capabilities, uh, o- opening offices where we need great technologists from and want to have a presence in. Um, and have done most of the things that, you know, we, we said we were going to do. We're not, you know, out, uh, frankly, I'd like a whole lot, bunch more I want to do, but we're in 50, we, we're now in 56 markets and 29 languages around the world. We have offices in Seattle and Sunnyvale and San Francisco and LA and Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as the existing offices we had in Iowa and in Arizona, uh, and have just been growing the company. And we've been growing at 15% uh, per year. Uh, we've gone public, which is another thing I wanted to get done. Uh, and, and so we've grown from about a billion dollars in 2012, and we'll be around $2 billion, you know, I think, uh, in bookings this year. So that's pretty, it's uh, that's pretty cool. No, it's been super fun, man, I'm telling you. A great group of people we have working here. We're all pretty pumped about what we think the company can be and how we can you know, help you know, shift the global economy towards small business uh, by, by helping people get their idea uh, online. So the company is headquartered in Scottsdale, is that right? It is, that's right. That's where I am right now. Yeah, and um, I'm just curious, what's the tech and startup scene like in Scottsdale? And have you ever felt the need to potentially move the company to Silicon Valley? Which, by uh, the way, is a question I get asked all the time, being a tech entrepreneur in LA and not really? being up north. You know, it's interesting. Um, the tech community in Phoenix is actually pretty strong. And there's a lot of folks that are coming into Phoenix because the economics of the area are, are easier than they are in the Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, you know, you're, you're in, in the LA area, so you know it's quite, quite different. Mm-hmm. Silicon Valley is an incredibly expensive place to hire people and, and to some degree, uh, and I've talked to other CEOs about this, and, and they've, they've expressed the same thing. It's you know it's hard to find loyalty in the valley because I think people tend to I, I used to call it they don't own they rent you know they go into a company for a few years have an experience don't have to move houses don't have to uproot their kids from school and they go work for somebody else yep. um, and it's a pretty rough place to compete for talent even though I love having presence there and, and know so many people there that it makes sense to be there and we're happy there um, <clears throat> but it's also quite a, quite a challenge and so I think for folks that are saying hey you got to move um, Michael move your company you know you'd be better off in the Bay Area you you have you know the whole Santa Monica area there's a lot of great uh, talent and whether it's Pasadena or Glendale or the South Bay there's a lot of really good people there yeah. who would rather stay there you know and, and the reason I've gone into Silicon Valley and Seattle and LA and uh, S- San Francisco and Cambridge is because people like it there. They want to they want to work uh, f- on a quest that is noble and something that's fun with people that are great to work with. So you, you have to be there. But at the same time, I don't have to move my headquarters mm-hmm. to do that. We like you and I are talking on Skype right now, and we could be talking on Zoom. We could be using Google Hangouts. Um, there's a there's a bunch of different products you can use yep. to have teams vir- virtually scattered all over the, the, the planet. If you think about Matt Mullenweg's company, the WordPress guys, they're, they're everywhere. Like they're I, actually, I actually went to their office, which they, they shared space with True Ventures. I don't know if they still do. Yeah. And we walked in, it was like two or three in the afternoon, and it was completely empty. It was a beautiful office with a couch and a, be- a view of the bay. It was gorgeous. And there's yeah. no one there. And I, I turned to Tony and I said, are they, are they on a field trip or something? And he's like, no, it's a, it's a virtual company. They have people absolutely everywhere. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, you can, you can do a lot of that. We, I mean, with all the offices we have, we still have great communications. We use video conferencing a ton. We have things called wormholes where we actually put a camera and a monitor at the end of a, a hallway that att- or end of a, like a row of cubes that mm-hmm. attaches itself to another hallway with a row of cubes in another office. And, and people can sit there and just, hey, John, you know, what, what do you think about this? I have a question for you. Here through the Here wall. Through. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's cool. 
So um, you mentioned GoDaddy's ads, and the ads to me are fascinating because um, some of the ads before your time have been called overly sexual and yet massively effective, right? Like GoDaddy, I think <laughs> what I read had an 80% brand recognition in American households, which is unbelievably high for a company yep. of GoDaddy size. So I guess the question I want to ask you is, A, do you feel the ads were almost like a necessary evil at the time to get the publicity? And then um, when you wanted to go public and you were maturing, kind of change course? Or, or how do you view that? How do you reconcile it? Yeah, well, I think well, you think he said it right. I mean, we, we um, at least part of it, those ads were incredibly effective, right? To have 80% brand recognition for a company of GoDaddy size, when you look at Apple and they're around 90, mm -hmm. you know, to be only 10, to, you know, to, uh, 10 points behind that, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So yeah. I, I am absolutely sure that without some of the, without the work that Bob Parsons, the founder, had done and, and without taking the risk of, you know, doing those ads, you know, it, the, we, we wouldn't be in the same place we are now. You know, he, he was, he went a place nobody else would go. He was bold as all get out. And that's who the guy is. Uh, very funny guy, got a big sense of humor and, and, and frankly said, you know, this is going to work. I'm going to do a Super Bowl ad. What do I know about the Super Bowl? They're mostly guys. They're mostly drinking. And this is going to get their attention. And, and Bob had told me once that, you know, domains, honestly, are about as, if you're trying to explain it to somebody, it's about as interesting as wet cardboard. And so if you can make something that's kind of funny and humorous and, um, and gets people's attention in a, you know, in, a, in a way that's shocking, you're going to get known. And he used that formula over and over again and built a big, big brand. Uh, and, and my role coming into the company was to you know, take the company, grow the company, be able to take the company public, um, and to, to build on top of all those things he'd done. And, and what, what we did was we tried to change the narrative. So it was about, uh, it was about small businesses, uh, what they did, what we do for them, and try to do it in a way, and who we are, and, and try to do it in a way that was you know, humorous and, and a little edgy. Uh, and what we were trying to do is, people would tell you, oh, gosh, of course I know GoDaddy. What is it that you guys do again? <laughs> um, so we were trying to get to the, the, to the person that uh, knows the brand but doesn't know what we do. Uh, most folks, that when, they knew, when they knew we went on a domain, boom, GoDaddy was the name in their head. They, they didn't have any others. You know, Net Network Solutions is not a super catchy, uh, catchy name. Uh, By the way, where did the name come from, GoDaddy? Well, it's like a lot of small businesses today. When small businesses are trying to figure out what they're going to name their company, they'll go up online to see if the, the URL is available. <laughs> and so uh, Bob and our CMO, Barb Rechterman, was... Uh, what year was this? This is, uh, what, 97? Okay. Well, so this is 19 years ago, right? And they're up searching around, looking for, you know, Bob's, you know, again, super funny guy. He's like, okay, let's call it Fat Daddy, you know, because you know, I'm not in great shape. We'll call it Fat Daddy. No, that's already taken already. How about Big Daddy? Okay, no, that's taken already. <laughs> what about GoDaddy? And uh, so they picked GoDaddy. It came in and announced Barb, and he came in and announced the company the next morning. I gave, and their name, <laughs> the name of the company was Joe Max Technologies, which is a road in Scottsdale. Uh, and he said, okay, we've changed the name of the company from Joe Max Technologies to GoDaddy. And, and, you know, the people in the office looked at him and go like, are you kidding me? Is that a joke? <laughs> you know, kind of, but no, it's not a joke. That's what we're going to call the company. But yeah. it's pretty funny. It is funny. That's a great story. Um, what's your relationship like with Bob Parsons today? Is he still active in the company? Do you call him and seek advice? Is he chairman? I, you know, I, I do. You know, he's not the chairman. He's a board, he's a board member. Uh, but I do talk to Bob uh, quite often, uh, more often than the other board members. Guy has incredible insight into what we do. He's actually a great marketer. He is uh, not active in the company. He has got like so much other stuff going on. He's running a golf uh, a golf equipment company now called PXG Parsons Extreme Golf, who have signed a ton of really top notch uh, PGA Tour players, including Zach Johnson, Chris Kirk, Rocco Mediate. Uh, and that's just that's just the, the PGA and senior PGA tour, and the clubs I'm playing them are insanely good, uh, and have gotten me about a club and a half longer than uh, than what I was hitting before. So you know he's the kind of guy that will experiment, will be using his 
mind very creatively, will take a very different approach than traditional companies that are in that business and, and you know, have a success on his hands. And he's doing really, really well with it. Very cool. What's it like being a public company CEO? I don't think you had done that before in your career. Uh, what are the most surprising things about it? Um, so the, the, is nothing surprising. I wouldn't say it's, it's surprising. I, I would say that a couple things happen and were, were benefits of taking the company public. Um, the brand became recognized. You know, when you are a public company, people know exactly how big you are and how fast you're growing because, and they understand the metrics because the metrics are governed by you know, the SEC. So they know that, that that stuff's all real. We had been running the company like it was public, you know, basically since I got here. So we were, you know, trying to get a rhythm of business with quarterly board meetings, with in some cases even readouts of what the results were, um, and had been thinking about it for quite some time. So from my perspective, um, not a whole lot of difference because the cadence and the rhythm of the business that we had developed was was pretty public. Now there are some things that are different. Like I I announced that we you know we Marta Nichols, who's our head of IR, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, runs a very good process. When we commit to a date, we've committed to the date and you don't move it. And we try to do that for the entire year and then try to do it for the next year. So my schedule has become a lot less flexible and, and immovable uh, as of all of ours. Um, that, but it, it has been good discipline, I think, uh, for us to, to measure in a way that can be compared to other companies. And uh, it's it's been really interesting. The most I mean, the biggest change is what I can say to the company and what I can't, because you know I'd love to report, you know, what our monthly what our month looked like uh, to to employees, and we can't do that any longer. We we have to be when we do our quarterly uh, town hall or all hands meeting, we do that after uh, we've announced on the street because we can't really we, you'd make everybody in the entire company an insider if you told them what was happening. So we have to actually do that after the fact. That must so be those frustrating. kind frustrating. Of, I'm sure there's stuff you want to tell them. Yeah, it, it's true. Uh, it's true. But that is that is probably my most frustrating part of, of it. And it's honestly, it's not frustrating. It's just the way uh, way that it works. And I've been in companies that were exactly like that, you know, some, uh, some small, some big, uh, where you have to be cautious on how you disclose and be thoughtful about it. So, you know, it's not that big a deal. So, um I also read that you were super impressed when you were considering the role about the loyalty that GoDaddy customers displayed. And yeah. um, is that correct, by the way? That's true. Okay. I'm curious uh, what you think drives that loyalty. I mean, how do you get people to sort of fall in love with a brand uh, versus just know about it? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, and it, it actually plays into your service, your service, uh, angle on this call that the GoDaddy service mentality is quite different than other software companies who view service as a cost and as a support. Uh, we just support people. They call up, we try to get them off the, solve their problem, get them off the phone, have them reference a the fact, go read the fact that'll solve your problem. We do, we have a very different uh, methodology that we use. We try to consult with customers. We ask them where they are in their life cycle. We ask them, if, you know, and we actually segment our customers psychographically, not, you know, lawyer, restaurant, the hotel, et cetera. We actually think about you're nascent, you're small and hungry, you're up and running and dreaming big, you're established and content, or you're an e-commerce guy. Um, and if we know where you are in your life cycle, we can give you advice on what you should be doing next. And while we're doing that, we can give you more confidence. Uh, and tell you what the next thing is that you should do or you should buy from us. Uh, and so we end up with a very, very stable cohort where, you know, 85% of our customers stay with us. And after the first year, which is where most uh, most attrition happens, they stay with us. They're with us for a couple of years or with us forever because they know they can call us. They can get their questions answered. Uh, they can talk to a real person who really wants to talk to them uh, and not try to get them off the phone. Uh, and 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 be able to service them in a way that's superhuman. So if you think of us as being a, a technology company with a very human touch, that builds better loyalty than being a technology company that you know that there's got to be people working there somewhere, <laughs> but you never get to see them. You know, and I, I've had customers tell me, "Man, I've tried to call Google. No, no way. 
I don't I, even I think Google saw. has a main phone number that's published. I mean, you got to work. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've heard you view your, your customer service team as a secret weapon. Um, and I also read that they account for up to 25% of your revenue in a given yeah, quarter, right. um, which, which is incredible. Um, and it's interesting because you guys are serving small businesses, which historically are a category that are uh, expensive to reach. They don't spend that much money. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of reasons why if I was writing out a business plan, I might not go after small businesses first because it's expensive. Absolutely. Um, yeah. How do you reconcile that? Um, you got, you're clearly spending a lot of money on customer service. I've always, I always think the best marketing is great customer service, which you clearly are doing in GoDaddy. But how yeah. do you reconcile the cost of that compared to, you know, my $20 a year domain? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So that they I'll give you a couple, couple of different um, thoughts on this. The marketing that we did early created brand, brand recognition to a pretty extreme point. Uh, Barb Rechterman, our CMO, is a, an incredibly metrics-driven marketer who knows exactly how much money it costs to acquire a customer. And we also know what our lifetime value to that customer is going to be based on how long they stay with us. So if you have low churn and you have low attrition uh, and you have low acquisition costs, you can make, the, you can make small business pencil pretty well. Our lifetime value to cost of acquisition is 10x, wow. 8 to 10x, which is crazy. And it's a little, it differs by country, but overall, around 8 to 10x. And th those numbers in any business are incredible. You know, we're running about 60 bucks in terms of co cost of acquisition. If you think about constant contact, as an example, they're about 10 times up. They're about $600. You're spe if you're spending $600 to acquire a customer, you have to charge a lot more for your product mm -hmm. to be able to make a pencil. When you're charging $60 for a customer uh, acquisition, every customer acquisition, you don't have to charge much, right? So our average, you know, I think our average yearly spends around 125 bucks out of our base, which is muy pequeño uh, if you are Google or Microsoft. They're like, man, that's just not a whole lot yeah. of recurring spend, but they're, it's a subscription business. They're with us for a long, long time. So six and months. In six months, you've recouped your acquisition costs and then you're off to the races. Per, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and then, then we're, and that, that, that's uh, pretty, pretty handsome. Now, that, the care organization, that customer care organization is a profit center for us. So they don't just drive revenue, they drive margin. So those guys operate that entire business and based on the sales that they make inside the care center, they're profitable. But you're and then the other seventy five percent is all web. That's amazing. Um, because you don't usually think of a customer care representative as being a a profit center. Um, but you somehow have been able to do that in a way that's human, that's not um telemarketer or spammy or or things that might be negatively associated with a profit center. They're somehow building relationships and right. therefore driving revenue. That's right. We actually have two, we have a, a series of things that we measure the reps on and how they're commissioned and how they're paid. Um, it, one is, of course, sales. The other is where are their CSS scores? Where's their customer satisfaction score? So if they have a high CSS score uh, and they're doing a good job selling, then, then they're doing a good job, right? And they're making sure the customers feel like they were taken care of. Uh, and managing, look, we're not going to get everyone right, but we're averaging like 8.9 out of 10 on our, on our, uh, it's very high. It's a, it's a very, it's very high. And even when we train new care centers and we now have care centers, you know, care centers in Arizona and Iowa, and those two centers serve as Latin America. Well, I'll just say the, the Americas and a little, uh, English speaking markets like Australia, UK, um, Canada. And then we have a care center in India that covers all of India, and that's in Hyderabad, but it's only for India. And then we have a care center in Dali in China that's for our Asia uh, group, and then one in Belfast that is for Europe. And those two, let's use India and Belfast, which are the ones we've had the longest, uh, they're almost at the exact same number, at 8.9 number, because the way that we teach folks the tools that we use the CRM system that's that's uh, our own uh, allow, allows us to do it. So we end up having very similar CSS scores, and you know our a average order size, our AOS is about about the same. That's incredible. 
I wanted to talk about SOPA for a minute. Um, you came out against Godaddy's former support, support of SOPA, which, by the way, I admire that you did that. Um, and I'm just curious what you think the balance is between privacy and, um, and reasonable cases which technology companies should assist the government. In other words, are there any reasonable cases where it makes sense for a tech company to cooperate with a government agency, you know, there was a terrorist attack or something like that? Or do you, are you in favor of end-to-end -end encryption and super strong uh, policy constra or, uh, privacy constraints? Well, look, our, our number one, <clears throat> our number one obligation is the privacy of our customers. That's number one. So, you know, go governments can have a whole bunch of different opinions on what's right and what's wrong. But if it's not, if it's not breaking the law and they'll over, you know, governments can overstep and say, well, we think that's not right. Well, if you think it's breaking the law, then you're going to issue a subpoena and move, uh, move, move on that. Uh, but, but honestly, uh, if we get a subpoena from a government, uh, then you know we will uh, on, we will review the subpoena, honor the subpoena. We think it's right, uh, but it, that's that's something that anybody in business has to do. Um, but boy, I tell you, man, the, the most important thing I think that we can do is keep our customers' data private. It's their data, their personal data, their website data. That's that's all theirs. Does GoDaddy uh, routinely get? Hit up by the government for access to data and stuff like that, just like any hosting company. Uh, uh, if you are a SaaS-based company and you have customers on top of that SaaS, uh, on top of that SaaS backend, yeah. you are going to get requests from the government for information. Uh, that's why I have a policy that is that is pro, that is pro customer, pro privacy. Customers first, privacy first is extremely important. Yep, makes sense. Um. I wanted to talk to you about culture. You know, you and I met at a conference a few years ago uh, yeah. where you just replied to a cold email I'd sent you saying, hey, let's grab a coffee. We're at the same conference and we wound up going on a bike ride and, and doing some other fun stuff. Um, and from what I've read, that same kind of policy transfers to GoDaddy where you have an open door yeah. policy and there's a certain um, casualness and approachability factor that I think isn't that common among public company CEOs. I'm curious um, how important you think that is to the success of GoDaddy, and um, how, do you kind of go out of your way to you make yourself accessible to your employees? Uh, kind of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I do. I think Bob did the same thing. You know, I think Bob had a uh, he tried to create a company that was fun, that was energetic. Uh, I, I think people do their best work when they're having fun and they feel like they can express themselves. So. I'm very in favor of letting people be exactly who they are when they're in the office. And if that means you, you know, you wear shorts every day and, you know, wear long pants or you wear flip flops um, and you want to have a conversation with anybody, including me, then that, that ought to be the, the way the company's run. And I, I actually, you know, live passionately as one of our values at the company. And I, I actually believe that you, the CEO, you have to set that example and, for me, you know, you can see I got a balance board in the back of my office over here that I take phone calls on, or I can, you know, get a little bit of a core and quad workout while I'm doing a conference call. I have a drum set over in the corner, uh, and and tell people, look, you know, your your life. If you think about life generally. That people that work hard and and love their job, but also you know love their family. Quite often, your job will invade your home life without a whole lot of consideration, and because you love your job or you work hard, you'll let that come in. Uh, so I'm actually in favor of saying like, well, bring some of your life in. Like if, if your work is going to go interrupt your life and you're going to make that okay and you're going to explain to your wife or your kids that, that hey, I've got to get on a conference call real quick. I'll be back in an hour. Then, then make the other true as well and let some of your life come into the office. And so I, I've, been, uh, I've been a proponent of that uh, for really forever. Uh, and whether I was at whether I was at Microsoft or whether I was at Yahoo or here, so that's very much uh, the way I think the company should be run. And I think one of the reasons I'm in this job is because culturally that was a fit for them, um, and it 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 feels right. I mean, I, I'm I'm the same guy pretty much at home that I am in the office. Um, all you know, all the way down to if it's hot, and, and I'm in Scottsdale right now, so it's hot, and I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> It's, it's, it makes total sense. And I think that a lot of CEOs really make a mistake of kind of putting up this veneer and 
as a result, they're not approachable and they're also not themselves. So it's awesome right. to see the reversal of that. Um, so you've also been a champion for uh, equal pay for women. Um, yeah. You've taken a public stance on this. You publicly share stats on it. Um, you sponsor students to attend the Grace Hopper Conference. Um, why is that important to you? And, and why don't more public company CEOs take a stand? Uh, I think more company, more public company CEOs are starting to, to take a stand. Uh, I, I've always believed that diverse workforces produce better products. Um, I've also believe, you know, you'd have to be blind and not to see that women minority has been underrepresented in the tech field for the 30 years I've been in it. Um, just go to and, a tech conference and you'll look around and, and know that any, any conference except the Grace Hopper conference yes. uh, is, is it's pretty clear where the, where the ratios are and where the numbers fall. And, and you know, women are, are just as smart as guys are. They're just as inclined for mathematics as as, uh, as, as anyone, right? There's no gender bias in mathematic or scientific aptitude. So what can we do to try to improve the, the market for, for women in tech, which will help build companies? Now, it's a, it's a hard problem because it starts in, you know, in elementary school and, you know, Hadi Partovi can talk to you about this in spades, but starts in elementary school, goes up to junior high and high school and, and fewer and fewer women matric matriculate out of, out of tech and computer science and hard sciences. They may go into biology or chemistry, but they, they, they stay away from some of the engineering disciplines, um, which are incredibly creative, I, I believe, especially in computer science where you have just a ton of potential, um, solutions to any one problem. So the creativity is huge there. So I, I've, I'm passionate about it. I have been for a long time. My sister passed away about 15 years ago. Um, and she was a, a, a very large proponent of equality for women. Um, and she passed away kind of tragically. Uh, and she was, in fact, one of the leading, um, certainly in the U.S., one of the leading authorities on um, the effect of media on women and, and self-esteem and body image. Uh, and she pushed really hard to, to solve that and was, in fact, an anorexic and a bulimic herself growing up um, and was trying to do as much as she could. And when she passed, my pr promise to her was that I'd do everything I could in my chosen field to advance women. And I didn't know what that meant at the time or what I'd be able to do, but I've been able to at least move, the, I think, move the ball a little bit, um, certainly at my company. And, I, and by, by making some of the things that we've been doing here at GoDaddy public, um, I think it, it, it creates an, an environment or at least a situation where there's got to be a response. So when we published our salary data by level for engineers and found out where we were from a parity perspective and did some did a lot of research and started spending time with the Claimant Institute to improve the way our language is used in job requisitions and applications and in uh, performance reviews like uh, and promotion documents. We started changing the language to make sure that we didn't have bias built into it because we're all biased, uh, every one of us. Anybody who says they're not, like we're more biased than somebody who's aware they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think it was a really good opportunity to be able to do, do something and kind of level the playing field and, and, and at least do something that can help. And where are you at today? Is the playing field leveled completely? Is it more level oh, than GoDaddy? Well, it's gotten better. Um, so we're, our numbers are moving. The end, you know, this is going to be a couple decades solution, right? It, when you have numbers that are as big as we're talking about, we've got half a million open jobs for computer scientists right now in the States. Uh, it takes a long time to change the, the, change the numbers dramatically. So it's going to be a very slow move. Uh, you know, we, our population's only changed, you know, one or 2%, but, you know, encouraging as our new college grad computer science entrance, we were at 50% women. Wow. Uh, for our new interns, uh, this year's interns were 37% women. So we're seeing movement uh, and you just kind of keep keep doing the right thing and just keep trying to create an environment that's great. Um, and I think put your put yourself out there. And frankly, that was one of the things I thought I could do to help solve it was put myself, put myself out there in a way that was demonstrative that other 
folks that are CEOs of other companies would be willing to um, willing to do too. Yep. I want to selfishly ask you a customer service question, given the line of work service is in, um, yeah. and ask you about bots and the idea of using bots for customer service. Um, you just told me a little while ago that customer care accounts for 25% of revenue and that relationship is so important. What yeah. do you think the role is, if any, of a bot for the future of customer service, both at GoDaddy and kind of in the world? Uh, look, I, think, I think it could be good actually if you and if you think about the continuum of service that's out there there's fac you know just faqs that exist there's uh, chat which can be human assisted chat um and then there's real live support and to think that that that's those are the three selection points uh that doesn't doesn't really make sense i've got email so that's another form where i can get i can send a query i can get something back that's not a bot but it's somebody who's going to go through a corpus of data and send you the most appropriate response. And if you can actually algorithmically tune a bot to be to have the right answers when queried, it can actually be quite helpful. Now, it's not a personality. I think Alaska Airlines, I think, has done a pretty good job with their bot. Ask Jen. Yeah, ask Jen. She's pr pretty pretty darn good, I think. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't give me all the answers I want. Sometimes I still in frustration call and talk to somebody real. Uh, but I think there's a place for it. It's not going to ever replace human interaction because uh, I think human interaction is that has warmth associated with, has humility, has personality, has laughter, and those things don't come as readily. I think from a bot. Not to say that the, the, the you know as technology gets better and better, it could it 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 could could be there. Yep. But I I, I believe it's I believe people matter a great deal. What do you think about the landscape today? You know, Facebook is making a huge push towards bots and trying to get brands to build on top of Messenger. You've got yeah. Twitter that's trying to be the customer. It still is the de facto customer service platform of choice. We see yeah. people create Twitter accounts just so they can complain to a company. Um, <laughs> I've seen that for do, sure. do you, I guess, do you use any bots in your life today? Have you seen any bots that have impressed you? Well, I used Alaska Airlines as being one that I thought was, was, uh, was pretty, pretty good. Um, I haven't seen anything that's really blown blown my mind. I've seen some of the work that Facebook's been doing. So it's, uh, it's interesting. I think actually it could be good for for folks that are trying to build brand uh, and not trying to have you know real human trying to purport to be real human interaction. Yep. Uh, there's some pretty interesting things I think you can do around brand that could be bot oriented uh, for a service experience when somebody's really having trouble finding. Uh, how to do something or get to the root of a problem. Uh, the, I think there's got to be a continuum. And I, to think that you could go from, this for me, this is Nirvana, where you can go from fact to a bot to a chat to a real live person. And there's a continuum of history between all the things that you did there. So you're not, you don't feel like you're being handed off to another system and you have to re-explain your problem or re-explain what your issue was initially. If you can get that level of data that underlies all of those platforms, and you know, quite honestly, uh, you know, people are a platform. You have a bunch of technologies that sits under uh, underneath every transaction and interaction we have in our care organization, and all that data is saved. Yep. Uh, so we we know what's happened. And next time somebody calls in, we can ask them, "Hey, well, so how did that go last time?" Because you know, I, I can see that we had a had an issue with you know X last time you called in, and did that get solved to your satisfaction? You know, that um, same data exists in all those other scenarios. So you could actually have that, that conversation you had with a real person be informative on how a bot actually treated you. Yeah. And you're basically you're saying just connect all the channels. I mean, I'm amazed if I tweeted a company, if I tweeted them a week later and they don't know who I am. I, it's amazing to me how if I tweeted them the first time, they didn't connect my Twitter name to my account, so they would know. It's just kind of um, it's, uh, it's it's pervasive. What you just described is the way the industry acts today. Yeah, like you don't you don't find that continuum of of store and forward to real time to live with you know the slice of slice bots in there. You don't you just don't find it. Yep. So my last question is. Um, I thought it was so interesting that I kept reading that you were semi-retired, which by the way, I still want to understand what semi-retired means, the semi. I never, 
I've never said it. <laughs> okay, so other people said that. I've never said that. Yeah. Okay, but but there was a period of time. What was it? Eight months that you weren't really. Well, I mean, when back? I left, I left Microsoft. I left for three years, and I I traveled around the world with my kids. Uh, my wife and I homeschooled them for a year and just kept traveling. Um, I recommend half of that, the traveling part, the homeschooling part. Not not so sure. Uh, we didn't ruin them. That's the good news. They're, they're, one's, one's graduating from UCSD right now, and the others at UW, so they're fine. Um, so that was a three-year hiatus. So that was one year travel and two years teaching at Pepperdine, which was you know, I felt part time. Uh, and then I just kind of got restless and, and wanted to go back to wanted to go back to doing something that I felt had scale and meaning. And I took the chief product officer job at Yahoo, which I thought was could potentially be a really great publishing platform and had a huge amount of customers. Uh, so I did that, and then when I left Yahoo, and that was after uh, a little bit of board turmoil and some other things that were going on there. I took, uh, I did take nine months off to spend it with my my oldest son before he went off to college um, to figure out what I actually wanted to do. I wasn't in a rush. Um, we were finishing a remodel and a couple of other things, so I I was being pretty selective. I sent a mail out to a couple of friends in the valley and. Uh, and a couple of exec search guys and said, okay, look, I'm ready to go back uh, to work. And I had gotten a couple of things lobbed in at me while, while I wasn't ready to take anything. Um, so I guess that, that's kind of what it was. Do you think you'll was. ever fully retire? And what, what would oh. you do with yourself if you did? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I've got a lot of things I like to do. I mean, I love, I love golfing and, and playing those things. and. Uh, Teaching was pretty fun. There's a whole bunch of things that I will, you know, occupy myself with. Well, will I go back and, and have, uh, you know, an 80 hour a week job? I don't know. I, I, I have, if, if, you know, I think the future is always informed by the past. Those that, those that ignore it tend to, tend to fail. So I, you know, I, I don't know. How, I don't know what it looks like. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. It's not. It's not a decision I'm making anytime soon. Anyway, so it's like. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's. A, I think it's. I'm having an awful lot of fun. I think oh, it comes down to: are you, are you working at something important? You're doing it with people you love. Are you having fun doing it? Um, and you know, all those things are are thumbs up. And as long as the board's happy, the the investors are happy, and my wife will tolerate my schedule, and I'm good. <laughs> It's a great way to end. Great Blake, way. I want to thank you so much for, for joining me today. And this has been another episode of uh, Please Hold.